first, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors whose annual financial support helps underwrite public programs like this one today. They are Denton's, Douglas Development, Antunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Buyer Blender Bell, EHT Traceries, and KCE Structural Engineers. Many thanks to you all for your dedication to historic preservation in Washington, DC. So before today's presentation begins, I just wanna share a few brief technical notes about how uh, the program will work. So please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen to ask any questions of the presenters. Um, I will collect your questions and verbally ask them of our presenters, um, mostly at the end of the program. Uh, but if there's a few you know, clarifying questions, please feel free to ask those. Um, and for those of you joining us on Facebook Live, DCPL's Director of Development, Kelly Knock, will be monitoring any questions you might all have and will pass those along to me as well. And if we don't get to everybody's questions, please feel free to email us at info at bcpreservation.org and we will find those answers for you. So uh, today you will be hearing from DCPL's Executive Director, Rebecca Miller, and our Public History Fellow, Kate Morgan, about past and current initiatives to create a more inclusive and diverse DC inventory of historic sites. And with that, I will turn things over to Kate. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. So a lot of these questions that we're gonna kind of talk about today um, are inspired off my own research that was um, questions that I kind of had when I first started here at DC Preservation League and kind of the history of diversifying the inventory in the past and looking at the work that we're helping to complete today. So I think before we can talk about diversifying the inventory, what is the inventory? So prior to the 1960s, landmarks in Washington, D.C. dot the landscape unprotected and endangered of neglect or development across the Capitol. In response, the National Capital Planning Commission and the Commission of Fine Arts established the Joint Committee on Landmarks, or JCL, in 1964. Tasked with the creation of a D.C. inventory of historic sites, the JCL identified and documented historic landmarks significant to the district's cultural and aesthetic heritage. By November of 1964, the JCL compiled a report of preliminary list of DC landmarks as a necessary step in the development of a comprehensive program to preserve and make and, yeah, and make creative use of our heritage from the past in the planning of the city today and in the future. While admittedly tentative in nature, incomplete and imperfect in many details, as they said, the JCL's report lists 289 structures and places for consideration and defines criteria and categories for DC's preservation moving forward. They created four categories classified um, the sites by their measure of quality and importance for future preservation efforts. Category one were landmarks that must be preserved. Category two represented landmarks that should be preserved or restored if possible. And category three listed sites that should be preserved or restored if practical, practicable. Category four serves as kind of a catch-all for all of the sites that might not have come to their attention, um, but would in the future. Well, the DC inventory of historic sites became a useful tool for documenting historic landmarks. There weren't any real protections for these sites. In other words, the inventory was merely suggested sites to preserve, but without federal legislation. In the kind of mid to early 1960s when this was created, DC at that time lacked home rule, um, and could not implement local regulations. The list held no power to prevent the raids of historic sites. As the decade went on, preservation movements took hold of other major cities across the United States, resulting in the creation of the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966. Through this legislation, the federal government established the National Register of Historic Places and the National Historic Landmarks Programs under the National Park Service, enumerating the sites of national, state, and local significance. The creation of this law, some historic buildings and sites gauge protection under the federal government. That same year, 1966, the National Historic Preservation Law came to be. The American Revolution Bicentennial Commission, or ARBC, organized to plan, encourage, develop, and coordinate the commemoration of the American Revolution Bicentennial. The committee recommended the Bicentennial Commemoration embody three different themes, Heritage 76, Open House USA, and Horizon 76. These ideals symbolize the past, the present, and the future. Over the next decade, the ARBC implemented these themes into their national planning and programming for the bicentennial amidst political, social, and racial unrest. 
that kind of brings us to kind of the research aspect. So as the commemorative planning continued, 1968 marked a pivotal moment in American history, especially for the civil rights movement. That year, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. led the Poor People's Campaign, a multiracial movement for economic justice in the war on poverty. In January of 1968, Dr. King delivered a speech arguing for the expansion of the 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom and President Lyndon Johnson's 1964 War on Poverty into a broader national movement. Dr. King proposed an occupation of the National Mall, pictured here, Resurrection City, in 1968. However, before this campaign, MLK was assassinated in April of 1968. An SCLC member, Vincent DeForest, witnessed this Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C. and donated a portion of the Hunger Wall to the National Museum of African American History and Culture in 2016, pictured here. In an interview with the, Nas with the Smithsonian Institution, DeForest reflected on his own activism and his place within the civil rights movement almost 50 years ago. At one point, he remarked, the death of King really released the kind of activism that I had never seen before, and everybody was willing to contribute something, end quote. DeForest mentioned feeling a certain urgency to become more involved in shaping what was happening to him and other marginalized Americans. For DeForest, he continued his social justice activism through the organization of the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation. Formed in 1970 by Vincent and Robert DeForest, the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation, or here on out, ABC, continued the revolution for civil rights by countering the white historical narrative perpetuated by the ARBC and associated bicentennial activities. A nonprofit organization, ABC's mission was to promote program programs to improve the quality of life among Black Americans in line with the forthcoming commemoration. The organization hoped to challenge the ARBC and inspire new interpretations on more inclusive American history. They believed their work was an ongoing process of decolonization and part of a larger movement towards self-realization and self-government by people determined not to be kept in subject status. In particular, the ARBC's Heritage 76 theme caused the ABC to question who is responsible for communicating heritage and why were Black voices and experiences not considered. By 1971, ARBC Chairman David Mahoney formally asked the ABC to promote programs to improve the quality of life of Black and other minority Americans in conjunction with the Bicentennial. In turn, they organized several local and regional meetings to address why the Bicentennial should be, what the Bicentennial should be to the Black people of the United States, culminating in a national conference. The ABC received funding from the National Park Service for such programs and enlisted the help of Black historians, social scientists, politicians, and activists. In January of 1972, the ABC coordinated a meeting of 20 leading authorities on Black history and culture to gather in Washington, D.C. to discuss how best to salute the Black heritage as an important aspect of the overall observance of the bicentennial in four years' time. Then Secretary of the U.S. Department of the Interior, Roger C. E. Morton, announced that the department must address the historic preservation program of the National Park Service more directly in commemoration of America's Black heritage than they had in previous years. Following the symposia, the Department of the Interior announced a nationwide study of historic places significant to the role of Black Americans in United States history. The Department of the Interior hired the ABC to conduct this research and compile a list of sites for designation on the inventory of national historic landmarks. Through this contract, the ABC penetrated the white structures of the government regulated cultural heritage field. Now, prior to 1973, there were only three historic sites affiliated with the Black experience designated to the National Register across the entire United States. Those sites were the Frederick Douglass House in Anacostia, Washington, DC, the Booker T. Washington House in Franklin County, Virginia, and the George Washington Carver House in Newton County, Missouri. With this in mind, the ABC sought to expand Black representation in the historical narrative and the built environment, which became possible through a government-sanctioned context study and funding from the National Park Service. Following the symposia of Black intellectuals in Washington, D.C., the ABC published Beyond the Fireworks of 76 in December of 1973, pictured here. Through their extensive research, the ABC produced a summary report of 30 sites determined to be significant in illustrating and commemorating the role of Black Americans in United States history. This report compiled a list of these sites for the first year of research of a three-year contract with the National Park Service on historic sites significant to the Black experience across the United States. 
In their report, the ABC identified national assumptions that the history of white men in America is synonymous with American history, as they claim, as reflected in the sites nominated to the National Register up until that point. If sites were related to Black heritage, however, ABC found that their associations were carefully omitted. To undermine these false histories, the ABC restored to the work, resolved to work within the white hegemonic systems at play, and they called for the re-identification and re-examination of historic sites in an American context or with the acknowledgement of the contribution of people of color, as this quote states um, on page five of the Beyond the Fireworks of 76. To gain representation in the National Register though, meant nominating historic sites using nationally defined criteria and taxonomies sanctioned by government agencies. In the 1970s, a major contributing factor to the historicity of a building and its architectural style or architect in their report, the ABC claimed the National Park Service criteria for the determination of historic sites is architecturally biased in, the app in its application and therefore is discriminatory by making it extremely difficult to qualify those sites, which are directly associated with the Afro-American con contribution to history and the development of this country, end quote. By exclusively defining a structure's significance to the mostly likely white male architect and architectural styles from the times of slavery through the Jim Crow South, the criteria barred the Black experience from recognition in the landscape. Argued best by the ABC to commemorate American history through American buildings alone displays an extremely limited understanding of what history is. Acknowledging this fault, the National Park Service hoped the ABC's work would remedy the disparities in the National Register. However, the system of the National Register did not radically transform, remaining imbued with the white assumptions of people in place. Without the National Park Service changing the taxonomy or listing feedback from human matters, the ABC struggled with the confines of ethnocentric white Americans' perspective of history found in the criteria. That leads us to kind of where we are today. So by 1977, only a year after concluding bicentennial celebrations, the ABC designated over 60 Black historic sites to the National Register, exponentially increasing Black representation across the historic landscape. While well, there's still much work left to be done in diversifying the inventory of historic places, which Rebecca will talk about shortly, the ABC acted as an impetus for modernizing historic preservation efforts in the nation's capital as well as across the country by challenging the way we view and qualify historic sites. Some of these sites located in DC include the Blanche K. Bruce House, Mary McCloy Bethune House, Mary Church Terrell House, Carter G. Woodson House, Charlotte Fort and Grimke House, St. Luke's Episcopal Church, and Mary Ann Shad Carey House. We can explore all these sites on our newest tour that was just published today, Preserving Chocolate City, which features the historic preservation of these sites by the Afro-American Bicentennial Corporation in the 1970s. So if you'd like to view that site now, you can go to that QR code that is on your screen um, or visit our app or website today. And with that, I am going to turn it back over to Rebecca. Thanks, Kate. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, I don't know if Kate did much of an introduction for of herself, but she is our American University Fellow. And so she's been doing a lot of work on the Historic Sites app. So I hope you've all been having the opportunity to enjoy it during our time at home. We uh, see that we have a big uptick in people looking at it online. So hopefully you'll get to utilize it in your apps as you're starting to explore the city again. Uh, so what I wanted to talk about a little bit was the different grant programs that we'll, we're working under uh, with regards to diversifying the inventory. As Kate mentioned, uh, a, something a, in line with 90 to 95 percent of the D, of the not only the DC inventory but the National Register are really um, buildings that um, are more relatable to the. Uh, white man, so to speak. So our white architects, uh, not necessarily about the, the black experience, Latino experience, women's experience. And so uh, that is one thing that DCPL and the DC Historic Preservation Office has been working to change. And so uh, several years ago, uh, there was funds appropriated by Congress in order to start the underrepresented communities grant. And so this is the goal of producing nominations, documentation that are submitted to the National Register. Uh, and they're, they're funded by this historic preservation fund. 
uh, these thing, these projects include surveys, um, their inventories. Uh, there are, um, uh, for instance, DCPL has a grant. Uh, well, the underrepresented communities grant. I should step back and tell you that is only available to uh, the state uh, historic preservation office. And so we partner with them on specific grants. So we have worked on, if you go to the next slide, please. Well, um, go ahead and click forward for me. Let's go back one, sorry, okay. Okay, well, I'll just talk a little bit more about these and then we'll talk about the projects that we're going through. Uh, we also have the African American Civil Rights Grant Program. This is a program that is available to um, for planning, development, research projects of historic sites, survey inventory, documentation, interpretation, education, architectural services. Uh, so this is much more broad than the underrepresented communities grants when it comes to what kind of uh, what kind of projects you can do. Uh, in FY20, they had about $15.5 million um, of funds available for this particular project. Uh, DCPL uh, was funded for our Black History, I'm sorry, Black Power Project. Uh, previously, we've been funded for a multiple property document on African American history. So I'll talk a little bit about those grants going forward. So next one, Kate. So as I mentioned, the African American Civil Rights in the 20th Century in Washington, D.C. So this is a grant that DCPL received uh, from the National Park Service. And this particular fund, um, this project is uh, at its completion, actually. So our consultant, Prologue D.C., uh, produced a multiple property document that includes multiple sites throughout the District of Columbia that are related to this particular theme. And it's identifying uh, the themes and the historic sites that are related to civil rights movement here in DC. Uh, we are planning on filing uh, this, this multiple property document within the next few weeks, and it will be associated with nominations uh, for the slow uh, elementary school in the Brooklyn neighborhood. And we expect those then to be forwarded to the National Register early this fall. Next slide. Uh, DCPL received um, a Black Power in the 20th Century uh, Context Study uh, grant. So this one will be actually a continuation of the Civil Rights Grant, and it's going to take place um, during this era of Black Power. Um, our multiple property document runs until 1973 for home rule. And so this one will carry on past that date in order to really explore this particular movement. That was some of the feedback that we received from a public meeting that we had on the African American Civil Rights Grant was to explore this Black Power era, which is really important here in the Washington, D.C. area. So once the multiple property document is filed, this will technically be an amendment to that document. So once that is filed, we will start soliciting for uh, consultants for this particular grant program, hopefully starting early this fall. Next. DCPL has just recently awarded the Women's History and Suffrage in Washington, D.C.'s Context Study um, grant. Uh, this is a grant that the National, or I'm sorry, that the State Historic Preservation Office received, um, and DCPL is administering the grant for them. We, uh, started the solicitation process back in January, and it was just awarded to Quinn Evans Architects. And this context study will explore the role of women in Washington with regards to the suffrage movement. And uh, this is an, uh, many of these sites that you see, obviously, in not only in this slide, but across the city where um, they are related to individuals that don't necessarily talk much about the suffrage movement. Uh, so DCPL is not only tasked with administering the uh, context study portion, but also DCPL will be producing two new nominations to be listed um, and also amending two documents. So many of the documents that you um, that are already within the inventory don't necessarily include this information. So when you're talking about Lafayette Park or something like that, or Pennsylvania Avenue, these particular nominations don't have information about that. And so uh, there will be projects like that that our Landmarks Committee will be looking at and producing nominations on in the future. Next slide. 
Uh, we're also working with the 1882 Foundation on the historic context study for the history and heritage of the Chinese and Korean um, um, communities here in Washington, DC. Uh, it's a rather small community, and many of you are familiar with our Chinatown. And 1882 uh, is working uh, with a number of other consultants in order to produce this document. And this is just the first phase of what we hope to be um, a larger context study for other uh, Asian communities here in Pacific Islander communities here in Washington, DC. So we're looking at context studies as being um, just chapters of a larger, um, a larger book, so to speak, on the history of individuals and communities here in Washington. Next. Uh, and also the LGBTQ context study uh, is another grant that was under the underrepresented communities grant program from the National Park Service through uh, the State Historic Preservation Office. And so there is a context study that is available uh, on not only the Historic Preservation Office's website, but in the DCPL uh, website as well. And you can read more about the themes that were identified with regards to the LGBTQ uh, community. And as part of that grant program, DCPL produced um, in uh, coordination with uh, HT Traceries two nominations for the Lucy Slow and Mary Burl House in Brooklyn and the Annie's Paramount Steakhouse uh, on 17th Street. And both of those nominations have been submitted, uh, have been, these, both of these properties have become DC landmarks and have been submitted to the National Register. Uh, Slow Burrell has been listed and we uh, received comments back on the Paramount Steakhouse and we'll be addressing those comments back to the National Register uh, in short order. So we expect them, the Annie's to be listed shortly as well. Next slide. Great. Um, yeah, so uh, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to uh, submit those into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and I will also wait and see if a colleague Kelly has any comments or questions from Facebook. Um, and just, you know, as we wait, I'll just explain this slide. So this is our contact information. Uh, you see our website there. Um, also our email address, as I mentioned uh, early, if you have any follow-up questions that maybe you didn't think of now, but you're thinking like come to your mind later, please feel free to email us. And then also you can see um, our the URL for the DC Historic Sites app, but you can also download it for free from the Apple um, App Store or Google Play. Um, and then right there at the bottom, we are on social media. So hopefully you will, if you're not already, you will consider following us. Um, our kind of handle is at DC Pres League. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We also have a YouTube account. Um, so a lot of the recordings from these programs go to our YouTube channel and also our website. So give a couple of moments if you have any questions. Um, I guess I have a question um, just, and sorry to kind of like throw this at you guys, um, but I guess, you know, uh, in addition to like, you know, becoming a DCPL member, um, if you aren't already, you know, what are other ways that the community, I guess, can get involved in projects like these? Um, you know, we have consultants, but any, any thoughts of that? Certainly. Um, so we, all of these projects are, once the, the drafts come in for them are, sent to our landmarks committee who review them uh, and provide feedback on the documents and uh, so it's one great way to be involved if you're interested in historic resource or um, research or um, how to research properties so that is a great way to get involved in that capacity if uh, anybody is so interested mm -hmm. we will also be having uh, upcoming community meetings uh, presentations on uh, not only Black Power uh, next winter, but uh, this fall, uh, everyone should look for a public uh, presentation on the draft 
uh, context study for women's suffrage coming in September. Yeah. And that will give everybody the opportunity to provide feedback as well if they're not interested in joining a committee here at DCPL, but the public will be invited to that as well as all the DCPL members, of course. Yes, so um, if you're on our newsletter, on our email list, you might have gotten an email yesterday about uh, our 50th anniversary celebration. So yesterday was officially our birthday. Um, we were founded 50 years ago as Don't Tear It Down. And this year we're going to be celebrating uh, that great achievement with a year full of robust programming. So uh, each month we're going to highlight a different theme that is related to historic preservation um, or just uh, Washington DC's history. Um, so this month we are highlighting most endangered places. Um, so, you know, be on the lookout. We just had a program with the photographer Carol Highsmith a couple of weeks ago. And next week, next Tuesday night, we're going to be premiering a uh, mini documentary series about uh, nine sites that have been on or are still on uh, DCPL's most endangered places list. Um, so we are actually working with um, a group of students from the American University Public History Program. They are the ones who are doing all this great work to put together this documentary for us. Um, so please be on the lookout for that. If you're not already, please sign up for our um, newsletter because every month we, at the beginning of each month, we will be sending out um, an events blast that includes all of these great programs uh, related to those themes. So uh, to learn more about all of this, we encourage you to check out our new webpage for the 50th anniversary, and I will be putting that into the chat now. So it runs through the different themes that we will be celebrating this year. It also includes um, a lot of historic photographs and information about um, past uh, board members, past staff members. Um, so we encourage you to look at that. And uh, we also hope that you'll consider a gift to commemorate this incredible accomplishment. Uh, 50 years as DC's leading advocate for historic preservation. Um, I put the donation chat, uh, the donation page um, also in the chat. Um, Rebecca, is there anything else that I missed that you'd like to mention? I uh, know, and so we have based uh, the information of uh, the past trustees and staff members off of documentation we have in the office. But if you were involved in the early days of Don't Tear It Down and your name's not listed or you have a story to tell us or pictures to share, we'd ask that you send them to us. Uh, we have an email dedicated to it, 50th at dcpreservation.org. And we'd love to hear the, you know, the other stories that haven't necessarily been told about uh, the 70s and 80s and 90s for that matter. So. Great. Um, thank you. Uh, so Kate, can you move on to the next slide? And I'll just, yes, these are our sponsors again. So again, so yeah, uh, we hope that you will uh, consider celebrating with us this year. We're very excited uh, to kind of look back, um, not only on the past, but also look towards the future and, you know, what that means for DCPL and historic preservation in the city. Um, so yeah, so I hope everybody enjoys the rest of your day. Um, and please let us know if you have any questions following this presentation.